Hello guys and welcome to a new Bible study session. My name is Eduard Sereduk and I'm really glad I have the honor today to share again from the Word of God together with you. This is the first session of a three-part series entitled God is Always Faithful. In the Old Testament, there was a king of the Moabites named Balak. And the children of Israel had just defeated the Amorites and were on their way to Moab. And the Moabites were afraid, got scared. So Balak, the king of Moab, calls Balaam, a man who had contact with the spirit world, to curse Israel. But Balaam could not curse them even though he tried several times and from different places. Numbers 23 verses 16 to 20 says this, Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he came to him and there, there he was, standing by his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab were with him. And Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Sippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. What did God speak through Balaam's mouth? That God is not like man to ever lie. You see, sometimes we humans lie, either on purpose to get out of a situation or by mistake, because we thought it was the, it was the truth. But God does not lie even by mistake. He doesn't say things like, hey, I've been here for so long that it slipped my mind when I said that. Not so with God at all. A very polished way of preaching, but very subtle and false, if I may say so, is this. No matter what happens, we know that God is faithful. Please allow me to tell you what is encapsulated in this statement, something that is not explicitly said, but is implicitly intended. Whether God will do what he has promised or not, he remains faithful. All Christians claim that God is faithful until it comes down to something specific where they need proof that it works. As long as it is spoken in general, all agree. Or we all agree that the word of God is true. But when we need something specific from the word to be fulfilled in our lives, we shy away with statements like, well, you can never really know anything for sure. We say he is faithful because the Bible says so and there is no way we can be born again Christians unless we affirm it as the Bible does. Isn't that right? But we find out if we really believe that he is faithful when we are faced with something that he has said and has not yet manifested in our lives. Outside of the church, you see, we know exactly what the words mean. But in the church of Christ, it's as if the smoke, the glory of God overshadow us to such an extent that words no longer mean anything. I hope you get the irony in this, in what I just said. For example, if someone outside the church takes a loan from the bank and at some point he or she stops paying the installments, he will be considered what? Unfaithful by the bank no matter how the economy and situations change. Why? Because that someone promised and signed a loan agreement with the bank that he or she would return the money regardless of changes in the country's economy, in the world's economy, or in his own financial situation. When it comes to God, though, we think completely different without realizing it. And I include myself here. Well, God is God. Even if he doesn't do exactly what he said, he's still faithful. He doesn't have to do everything he said, but he's still faithful. And so we shroud everything in a cloud of ungodly mystery and ambiguity 
even demonic, if I may so, uh, say so. And we bring into the scheme all the pompous theological words to gain more credibility in our unbiblical claims, such as, well, God in his sovereignty may have decided to do something different in a certain situation than what he said in the word. And then the common people will tend to say this. I don't really understand anything this man wants to say. But he certainly knows more than I do. Because he went to the seminary or Bible school. So I'll believe what he says. Now let's see what a definition of faithfulness would be. God is always faithful means that he, is all, he, will, he will always do what he said he would do. And he has already done what he said he would do. A more simple definition of faithfulness would be this. When you speak and promise something, you also do it. God is also always true to his word. Faithfulness is not something like you say one thing and then if another idea comes to you, you do something else and still remain faithful. No, that's a lie. Verse 20 of the passage above that we just read says that once God has blessed something or someone, that blessing cannot be reversed. The blessing is irreversible. How was God's faithfulness manifested and still manifesting in our salvation? Let's see. God said in Psalms 103 verse 2 to 3 this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Did God say that? Will he do that? Yes, of course. Has he forgiven all our sins even if we have done some very bad things or still are doing them? Yeah, sure, for sure. He has forgiven all our past, present, and future sins. How do you know this? Because he said so. Did he heal all our physical ailments or sicknesses? Yes, of course. How do we know this? Because he just said so in, the, in this passage that we read. But many Christians hold back when it comes to healing. As long as you don't have to see something tangible, like the, for example, in the era of forgiveness of sins, it's not something tangible that you see. God is faithful. No problems there. But when it comes to something visible, like physical healing, he is no longer faithful all of a sudden. We take no chances because if nothing happens, then all eyes are on us, right? And we are afraid. And I was afraid. If someone receives Jesus in his heart, what do we do? We gladly lead him or her in the prayer of repentance. And if after a week that person comes back and tells us, I don't know what's happening to me, but I feel like I'm no longer saved. We probably ask him, well, why do you feel this way? To which the person might respond, I just don't feel like God has forgiven me. What do we usually respond as Christians at that time? Well, I don't know what to say. Maybe he hasn't forgiven you. Who knows? No, not at all. We don't say that. But we, we tell him, you don't have to live by feelings. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 to 10, that if we make him Lord, he will, we will be saved. We live by faith and not by sight or feeling. We all have these feelings from time to time of doubt, but you don't have to dwell on them. These feelings must be ignored. Isn't that, this is what we tell them, right? But what do we do when we get to financial blessing or healing and we don't feel healed? Instead of saying, I don't go by what I feel or see, but by what the word of God says, we say something like, I trust God. He knows better what, what is good for me. Now we are saying something totally different from what God said. In Luke 5, verses 17 to 26, we see Jesus again, as in Psalms, in Psalms 103, verses 2 to 3, putting the forgiveness of sin on a par with physical healing. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, 
man brought a, a, on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of, of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. And they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Basically, what Jesus is saying here is that neither forgiving sins nor healing someone is an easy thing to do. Both are very hard to do, but in order to demonstrate that he has the power and authority to forgive sins, a thing that could not be tangibly proven in itself, Jesus heals the sick man, a tangible thing. In this way, Jesus shows that just as God's will for people is to forgive their sins, and for this he was going to give his life on the cross, as we know, in the same way, his will is to heal them physically. Therefore, physical healing was also included in the sacrifice on the cross, along with the forgiveness of sins. Jesus says in Matthew 18 verse 3 that unless we become like little children, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the characteristic of the children that Jesus is talking about here? A child's blind faith in what his father tells him, even if he doesn't see something right away. When a father promises his children that they will go to a theme park maybe or to the circus, those children are already happy and they rejoice as if they are going at that moment just because their father promised them. But if that father is a bad father, he could tell them, oh, no, 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 don't get excited. We don't go to any parks anymore. I just tricked you. I just told you that as a joke to see how you react. God is not like that at all. He never says, oh, did I say in my word that I healed you? No, it's not like that. No, 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 no. Do you really take the Bible seriously? I know it's, it seems funny when I say it like that, but this is exactly how we think about God and that's how we relate to Him. Let's go one step further now. Did you know that God was and is sovereign all the time and not only in certain periods of time? We often hear this phrase, God is in control. He is sovereign. God in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty knows that in this particular situation, something else would be better. How many of us know that God was sovereign and had all knowledge when he made the promises as well? God has not gained new information from the time he gave us a promise to the time we need that promise in our lives. God didn't say something and then later, later, later said, oh, I probably shouldn't have said what I said in such a libertine way. It will go to people's heads. God knew all of us when he made the promises. Right? He knew us. Now when you hear these things that I just, I'm just sharing now, some negative personal experiences or from the experiences of others from the past may come to your mind. But what about that? With that man's situation, 
I have an aunt or an uncle who has not been healed or even died, which is worse. We all have or have been through similar situations. You're not the only one. But the Bible tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. James 1 verses 5 to 8 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives only to some, right? No. He gives to all liberally and without reproach, meaning you don't have to feel bad that he gave it to you. And it might be given if it's God's will and if he is in a good mood. No, it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, Don't meaning to not even consider that it might not happen. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Notice how extreme and extravagant God is. He gives to all generous, generously without rebuke or blackmail. He is absolute, clear, and pragmatic. In, and in this passage, it is not only about wisdom, but about everything we ask from God. In verses 7 and 8, James makes the transition from one specific thing like wisdom to all things in general, using terms like anything or unstable in all his ways. Then let's observe the apparent redundancy. To ask in faith without doubting. Isn't the same thing? There are two ways of thinking that always come into conflict. Let's say that someone is sick and has in his family an Aunt Martha, fictitious name, who is also sick and has not been healed even though she prayed. And he also has an uncle, John, also a ficti uh, uh, fiction name, who died even though he believed in healing. When that person wants to pray for healing, there will be two thoughts in his mind, right? Number one, Lord, you said that by your stripes I am healed and I believe. Thinking number one, full of faith. But Aunt Martha was not healed and Uncle John died, even if he believed. Thinking number two, with doubt. That is why James says through the Holy Spirit to ask in faith without doubting. Is it easy not to doubt? The concept is simple, but not easy. When pressure comes into our lives, it is also that, that time when our very loyal logic and past negative experiences, both our own and others, they present themselves to our minds. But we will never gain anything by not believing God. Remember this. Another important thing worth mentioning here is that first comes the temptation to doubt and then the actual, actual doubt. Being tempted to doubt does not mean that we have already doubted. But only if we begin to speak and act on that temptation to doubt, that's when we have committed the sin of doubt. The temptation to doubt, which can come at any time to our minds and to anyone, should not be confused with doubt itself. There is another type of prayer among Christians when they pray, I collected them all now, uh, for others, a type of prayer through which man never makes a mistake. Only God does. This is, this is a little bit sad. Whatever is your will, Lord, with this situation, your will be done. And whether that man is healed or not, or whether he dies or not, that prayer will always be fulfilled, right? It is a very prudent and safe prayer for man, but not for God, his reputation. Or we pray in the following way. Lord, you see that this person is struggling financially and you know better why that is. Therefore, we now pray that your will be done. Jesus never prayed like this for people to get something from God. Have you noticed this? Yes, perhaps when we, do not, when we don't know God's will regarding a future situation or an important decision in our life, we can pray this way. But not when we have his will regarding that situation revealed clearly in scripture. But do you know why we pray like that? Because we want to stay in the boat, both in the boat like the other disciples, and walk on water like Peter did at the same time. 
And we know this is not possible. Jesus didn't tell Peter to come to him on the water and then five minutes later, in his sovereignty, changed his mind and let Peter sink so that he wouldn't go up to his head and consider himself better or be proud, better than the other disciples. Peter began to sink because of his doubt. He began to walk on waters. Can you, can you envision that? In faith, but along the way, he let doubt enter because he had probably never heard of any other man ever walking on the waters. And when he also saw the waves around him, he completely succumbed to doubt. But the word that Jesus gave him to come would have supported him to walk on the waters all the way to Jesus. I'm convinced now that I have already picked your interest for everything I said so far and a glimmer of hope has lit up in your heart. And you may be wondering now, okay, but how can I build this kind of faith? Romans 10, 17 says this. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, faith does not come by hearing or meditating on cases of people who have not been delivered, healed, or helped. We cannot allow ourselves to ask ourselves all kinds of questions like, I wonder what happened in that situation? Or what was the reason why the person in question did not heal? We also cannot command ourselves to ourselves or force ourselves to have faith when we are faced with the need and with the pressure. Faith is built before we face the need by regular meditation on the word. Living by faith must be a lifestyle. You just expose yourself continuously to the word and faith comes. At some point in your mind and in your emotions, the Holy Spirit makes a click in your conviction uh, and your conviction becomes unshakable. We must acquire a tunnel-like mindset that only looks ahead at the light at the end of the tunnel. That is the word, what the word says and pays no attention to what it sees or feels around it. In Numbers 21 verses 6 to 9 we read, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they beat the people and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, who when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. I don't think it was that easy for the Israelites to look at that bronze serpent. Because while they had to look at that snake that Moses made, poisonous snakes were still crawling among them, coiling around them, and maybe even biting them. However, God assured them that they would not die but live if they continued to look intently at that snake raised by Moses and not at what was happening around them. Did you know that the way we speak places us at a certain level in our spiritual growth? Language reveals if we are spiritual or not. Language locates us exactly where we are spiritually. Psalm 91 verses 1 to 2 says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. Let's notice that in verse 2, the one who says about the Lord, He is my refuge, does not do it in the church, but in his personal life when he is faced with a problem. This is not about what we say or sing in a church service. It is only when we step outside of church that we realize what we really believe. We sometimes hear some Christians speaking in their daily life like this. 
wow, this and that happened to me and I'm done. I'm done. And if we try to say something from the word, in that moment, we receive the following reply. I received it before. Yes, let's see how it will be when you end up like me and go through the same situation. This may be or may not be true. No matter how much we think about ourselves as being spiritually mature and knowing a lot and having had a lot of revelations in the past or going to seminary, Bible school, our everyday language locates us exactly where we are in our spiritual growth. We cannot talk just anything. Psalm 91 verse 7 says this, A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. The psalmist is not speaking here of people outside the church, but of people in the same church perhaps, our brothers and sisters on our left and right, next to us, that said, for whom the word did not work, maybe. Maybe they got sick or died, and you remain firm instead in your faith and say, it will not come near me. And that's not pride, it's faith. Another interesting thing related to this subject, which you may have noticed in your life or not, is that the truth is never with the majority. Numbers 13 verses 1 to 2 says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, to see if they can take the land, or if I'm going to give it to them, or if they like it, and if you still want me to give it to you, things like that. No, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe, uh, from each tribe of their father, you shall send a man, everyone, a leader among them. Notice that these spies were not ordinary people, but leaders. And God was saying one thing, and most of these spies, leaders, were saying a totally different thing. In Numbers 14, 2-9, we see that all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? It was better when we were not saved and didn't know anything about this church stuff, about faith, the fight of faith, and things like that. So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. Only two men of all those 12 spies were different, meaning approximately 16%. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. Not just good, exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which, uh, in, which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, not fear the pe uh, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. God is not at all blessed to send Jesus to pay all, his hu all this huge price and make all kinds of promises to us. And then having us not going and taking what has already been given to us. It does not bless God at all. When the spies came back, the people said, Most of the spies, our leaders, said that we cannot take the land. Since 10 out of 12 said it, it must be true. They know what they are talking about because they are also our leaders. Even though we come, we've come all this long way out of Egypt, and even though God said what he said, it doesn't matter. If we assume the majority is right, you will always, almost always be wrong. 
Out of about 1.6 million Israelites, only two entered the promised land. And that is 0.000125%. When Jesus came to the, to the earth and preached the gospel to the people and to the Pharisees and Sadducees, did most of the people believe what he was teaching? No. But who was right? They or him? If you believe Jesus, you receive life. But if you believe them, you receive death. If we take a look at religious systems uh, today, and I mean even born-again Christians, we have a lot of denominations. Many people in the body of Christ have education, which is very good, but no revelation from the Word of God. Only someone with revelation will say what God said his, in His Word, He wants us to have. It belongs to us. In Numbers 14 verse 9 we read, only do not rebel against the Lord, not, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. The two faith-filled spies did not see with their natural eyes that their protection was taken from the Canaanites. But by revelation and by faith, God waited for that whole generation to die in the wilderness. He doesn't mind it. What is 40 years for him? The people of Israel did not believe. And because of this, God turned them back into the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 long years until they died. And the church is the same way today for the most part. But God is bringing the church again in these times close to Canaan and encourages us to enter the promised land, which is here on earth, salvation here on earth, not only in heaven. But will you enter or will you decide to stay with the majority? Let's also think about the pressure on the next generation of Israel who entered the land. Little John now has grown up and is now an adult. And he remembers how his grandfather told him about the promised land that one day they would enter. But his grandfather died and he was unable to enter. Why would I succeed? Is John wondering. Father and mother also died. Aunt Martha died. When we let doubts, this kind of doubts, enter our minds, suddenly evidence is created to support our doubts. If that generation had looked at who didn't get in, they wouldn't have gotten in either. Now let's see, let's move on and see what faithfulness has to do with speaking. Let's read 2 Corinthians 1 verses 18 to 20. But as God is faithful, or according to how faithful God is, or the same way God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. God's faithfulness is closely related to his word. He is faithful to his given word. God doesn't say, yeah, I said that, but I've learned a lot since then and I know all about you now. Another interesting thing is that you don't enter God's spiritual inheritance all at once, but little by little. And patience is needed in addition to faith. In Exodus 23 verses 29 to 30, God told Moses that he would give him the land not all at once, but little by little. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too nu numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. If we expect God to do everything for us in our way and we just enter the land without any opposition or fight of faith, we are mistaken. Little by little, we enter into the great inheritance of salvation that God gave us on here to experience here on earth. Mind renewal doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And I'll stop here for today. I hope that you are blessed by this message and that it brought you joy, hope, and peace in your heart. May the Holy Spirit help you apply these things in your daily life 
and take you to ever higher spiritual levels with Him. Amen.